All right, I have a warning for us today. It is quite possible, no, it's uh, quite likely, that you and I have an imperfect vision of who Jesus is. And when we don't see him clearly for who he is, it impacts our following. So here's what happens. We, we tend to pick out our favorite scenes and we connect with those and avoid the others. And so in this series, what we're doing is trying to put together some accurate presentations of who Jesus is, because when we see him clearly, we can follow him clearly. So here's our first two images. Last week, we talked about washing feet. This week, we get to add to that image, making a whip. Can't wait to get to that. So in the first one, we saw, and boy, we worked hard to make sure that we accurately represented Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, even the feet of Judas, his betrayer. But if we're not careful, um, we use that as license to not address hard issues. We allow it to prompt us to kind of be doormats or to cower when things get uncomfortable. And what we do is we say things like, well, I mean, Jesus knew that Judas was gonna betray him and he didn't say a word, he just washed his feet. So I think I, this time I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. This week, as we add this making of a whip and flipping over the tables in the temple, if we're not careful, we have this image of Jesus losing his mind and losing control of his mouth. And when we get in situations where we know something needs to be said, we free ourselves to say it in a way that is filled with sin, thinking the end justifies the means. I mean, I know I lost control, but man, somebody had to stand up for this. When we don't have accurate images of Jesus, it impacts our following of Jesus, which is what this whole series is about. Come and see. Like, come and see Jesus. It's, it's what it's always been. And we encounter these people there in the gospels who are saying, come and see. And they're talking about Jesus, not, not themselves. Like the woman at the well, she knew she had a mess. Um, other tax collectors who were despised, prostitutes who were shamed, and others who thought God was done with them because they had sicknesses or maybe money problems, and they knew. So they thought, they were outside of God's blessing. And they were the ones who encountered Jesus and saw something very different than religion. And they were the ones who said, hey, I might still be in a mess, but you gotta come and see the one who is life. And in this season of our church's life, what a beautiful reminder for us that even in the midst of a devastating leadership failure, our invitation is come and see Jesus. It's always been about him. And so this week we add the next piece, the next image. So let me go ahead and set up this story of Jesus making a whip and flipping tables. It is quite a story. So go ahead and grab your Bible. We're headed to John chapter two, either your Bible or your Bible app. And let me start us off with a question. Did Jesus clean house twice? Now, let me tell you why we care. So in the Bible, if you're new to studying the Bible, new to church, uh, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all tell the story of Jesus from different angles. The first three are commonly called the synoptics. They gave a synopsis of Jesus' life, his ministry, his teachings. And for the most part, with very rare exceptions, they told the story in chronological order. This is what he did. This is what he taught. With John, it's different. His is not chronological as, most, as much as it is theological. And he tells us that. You can go to 2031, chapter 20, verse 31, where he says, I wrote these things down for one purpose, that you can come to believe in Jesus, and by believing in him, you will find life in his name. That's his purpose. And we're very confident that John moved pieces around. He wasn't worried about the chronology. He was worried about the 
theology. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In each of the four Gospels, there is one cleansing of the temple. But John's is at the beginning, whereas the other three were at the end. And some, in harmonizing the Gospels, have said, huh, Jesus must have done it twice. He did it once at the beginning. John told that story. Then he did it once at the end. The synoptics tell that story. And it, it seems like maybe that was, I don't know, more more confrontational. And the first time, maybe not as much. Well, what if, what if the likelihood is there was only one? And John intentionally moved it up to the beginning, proving Jesus is the temple. We'll come back to that in a minute. Here's why this is important. If Jesus cleansed the temple early in his ministry at Passover, and then it did it again at the end of his ministry at Passover then Jesus had a public ministry of about three years. One year before, one year in the middle, and a little bit of time afterwards. We would say three years of ministry. But what if there were not two cleansings? What if his ministry didn't last three years? What if it was 18 months? You see, the Bible doesn't tell us. Now, here's why that's important. If you grow up in church and you kind of learn the stories of Jesus... And interwoven into that are legends and interpretations and opinions, and you don't know the difference. You show up to your first place of employment, and you have a boss who despises Jesus, or maybe you show up at college and you have a professor who despises Jesus, or you meet a really smart friend in life who despises Jesus or, or does not trust God's word, and they pull one string, it all falls apart. Because we know the Bible does not say how many wise men there were. But if you've interwoven the tradition of there being three wise men because there were three gifts, you don't know the difference. And if you said, oh, Jesus' ministry was three years long and you don't realize the Bible doesn't actually teach that. We've just tried to guess. One string and your faith falls apart. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, you don't know what God's word says and what's just interpretation and opinion it doesn't take much to get your faith to fall apart, which is why we are committed to teaching God's word in context, why we do warehouse podcasts so you can hear all of the study that went into what I get to present on the weekend, most weekends. It's why we have Institute. You can actually sign up now. The new set of Institute classes start this Tuesday of how to study the Bible and personal formation. Like, what does it look like for you to grow? We are committed to helping you rightly understand God's word. Because if you don't, one little string pulled by somebody in your life and you think all your faith just crumbled. You gotta know the difference. So as we take a look at this next installment of the Jesus story, we are in for a treat in discovering accurately who Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him. So here we go. Verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There were three major festivals in the Jewish calendar during Jesus' day where men representing their families would do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Passover is one of them and arguably the most important one of them. Jewish men from all over the Roman Empire had traveled into Jerusalem, including Jesus. <laughs> so place yourself in Jerusalem, a city of about 30,000 that now has 2 million people. Uh, imagine a city like Carbondale or Paducah suddenly having the population of Nashville Metro smashed into town. It was wall-to-wall -wall people, which is exciting, and it was absolute chaos. And as Jesus comes into the temple, he finds those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. Now, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament sacrificial system, this makes no sense. So let me give you a little bit of background. God's law provided for, commanded his people to bring animals 
as both offerings and sacrifices. Now, that's, that just seems weird that God would want an animal. But it's not that weird if you'll just let it sink in for a moment. Animals were what they had. It was a gift they had to give in expressing worship to God. And it was pre-Jesus and the cross in that they were recognizing their sin, offering the life of an animal as a temporary covering for their sins. It's the way they said, God, we adore you, and God, we are sorry for our sins. We confess. So when they came for Passover or one of the festivals, they would bring animals, except a lot of people were traveling in from a long way away, like some of them up to 200 miles. You want to make a 200-mile journey even more difficult? Bring animals with you. Can you imagine like herding your sheep 200 miles? That was ridiculous. And so they set up the perfect solution. Come into town and buy your animal here. I submit to you that this was the first ever in the world convenience store. Here it is. Right here you go. Need an ox? Got one for sale. Oh, you need some sheep? Got it. Oh, you need to exchange your money to be able to pay the temple tax? Got it. We are here to serve you. This is what it had become. This is what it was every festival, every year. And Jesus finds a scene that upsets him. Look at what Jesus says. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. My house now quoting Mark's gospel, shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Let's put these pieces together. <laughs> Jesus comes to the temple and he is disgusted by how God's people have turned the temple, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, into big business. They had taken the worship of God, the place designated for the worship of God, and they had made it a convenience store. Think Bucky's. Like it was just <laughs> massive convenience store. And Jesus is like, this, this is just wrong. This is not what the temple was supposed to be. Big business. And then he says, you've turned it into a den of robbers. Not only was it big business, it was exploitation. Um, it was just wrong. You, you know how it is when you pull into a convenience store. If you're going to buy a gallon of milk, you're going to pay more. You show up at a ball game and you want a hot dog, you're going to pay more. Convenience is expensive. But, but now it had turned into exploiting God's people opportunistically. Oh, you traveled in 200 miles? Yeah. Yeah, the exchange rate from your region's not very good this year. I'm sorry. The temple tax just got a lot higher. Or, oh, I know, I know you wanted to bring your own animal, but we're kind of short. Did you look around? There's like 2 million people here. We're, it's a supply and demand kind of thing. I know prices are a lot higher than you expected, but what choice do you have? You can go back home. Or if you brought your sheep with you, they had the authority to say, nope, that one's not good enough. That one's blemished. You'll have to buy one of ours. And Jesus says, this is disgusting. You all have created a business and you are opportunistically robbing from God's people. And then there's one more. And I submit to you today that this is the one Jesus was most upset about, and it's the one we miss. Shout out to J.D. Greer, quoting William Lane and other theologians, who points out that phrase that on the slide right now is in the middle, my house shall be called a house of prayer to all the nations. If, if, if you know the story of the Bible, you, you know that God chose this man named Abraham before he ever had any kids. And he said, Abraham, 
you are going to be the father of many descendants, like stars of the sky. And through you, I will bless all people. If you know the story of the Bible, you know that God gave to his people, descendants of Abraham, a land, the promised land, a law, and a very special role, a role for all the nations. Abraham, through you, I will bless all people. My father's house will be a house to all nations, citing Isaiah. In Psalm 86, this will be for all nations. And, and what got lost in that is the all nations part. And what God's people had become focused on was their part. Oh, God chose us. Uh, he wants us. Hey, look at us. And we don't care about you if you're not one of us. Jesus was upset, infuriated by what God's people were doing in leaving everyone else out. So let me describe to you how this played out. So at the temple, you had the temple proper in the middle, and then on both sides of it, you had the court of the Gentiles. Now, as you look at this image, you might barely be able to see the red lines around the boundaries. If you were not Jewish, you could come into the court of Gentiles and watch. You could see the worship of God's people worshiping the one true God. You could look in, but only if you were Jewish could you go into the inner, the, the temple proper, and only if you were a priest could you go into even further than that. So imagine with me. You are not Jewish, like many of us, and you have come to the temple, and your desire is to, to look in and to see the worship of the one true and living God. You've heard about him. You've heard stories about him. And what you wanted to see were God's people worshiping him. But in the midst of this desire for you to see God and see God's people worship, you can't hear anything. And Jesus says, stop. God's people were so obsessed with themselves they didn't care if the Gentiles got left out. What they most wanted was convenience, the ability to buy animals right nearby. We can do the same. If we make our worship services about our favorite songs, what's comfortable to us, what we most enjoy, and we forget that one of the most important things that happens when we gather to worship is invite others to come. That's why we're having a friend weekend. Even if inviting a friend makes you a little bit uncomfortable, it's one of the essential roles that we play in the kingdom of God to say, hey, come and see. They had lost sight of the role that they had as the people of God, worshiping the one true God, inviting others to come watch. We, too, have that role. And Jesus was disgusted by how God's people didn't care about those outside the walls. So here's what he did. Making a whip of cords, verse 15, he drove them out of the temple people with their sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus caused a scene. Imagine, he has this whip of cords, and he's like, snap, snap, and he's driving these animals that are for sale to be used in offerings and sacrifices. He's driving them out of the court of the Gentiles, out of the temple, and their owners are following them. And then he is flipping over tables and pouring out the money of the money changers. He is causing a scene. And if we're not careful reading this, we will think Jesus has done, lost his mind, 
and lost control of his mouth. We envision him being red-faced. Okay, maybe red-faced. But we envision him just being out of control, saying things that he would regret, doing things that are absolutely damaging to other people. But if we know the story of Jesus, we know that couldn't be true. But that's how we see it. And to help us see it rightly, John added this little phrase at the beginning that if I'm being totally vulnerable with you, I'd kind of miss this part. It says, and making a whip of cords. Huh. So our, our team studying this, and we had our new residents at the table, and Parker Robbins said, I make whips. I thought, oh, crud, he's going to bring one. You know, how's this going to go? You know, but, but he said, I, I make those. He said, it takes me seven hours. And this text came to life in a way it's never come to life for me. You know, when I read, and Jesus making a, a, you know, a whip of cords, I just had in my mind, he pulled it out of his back pocket and just went crazy. But, but let's say it took him seven hours, give or take a couple. That means if it was afternoon when he walked in and saw this chaos he went home that night, made it, came back the next day. Or let's say it was early in the morning when he showed up at the temple and it took him five, six, seven, eight hours to make it. He's coming back late in the day, which means what? Every step Jesus took, he was in control of. As Jesus would say, I only do what I see my father doing. He walked in the power and with the guidance of the Spirit of God. Not once did he lose it. Not once did he lose control of the words that he was saying or the actions that he was committing. Every step he took was measured. You're like, well, Mike, Michael, do you get all that out of one phrase? Well, maybe. And, and there's even more. Look in verse 18 and 19 about how the temple authorities responded to Jesus making a scene. They said, what sign do you show us for doing these things? <laughs> so we're studying this text. And Parker Nave says, look at what they didn't say. They did not say, arrest him. If all Jesus was doing was criminal, they would have had the temple guards just arrest him. But that is not what they said. What they said was, what sign will you show us for doing these things? Now, there were times that the temple authorities, the religious leaders, would ask Jesus for a sign as a test. There were times that they asked Jesus for a sign, meaning, okay, what pedigree do you have? What degree? What rabbi did you study under? What is... What is in this question? What sign do you do these things? Is that they're asking for his authority. They know that what he just did is not criminal, but it's bold. And so what they're asking is, who gave you authority to do that? Give us your sign that indicates you have the authority to disrupt the events of the temple. It wasn't criminal, but it was bold. And they're saying, why? Who sent you? And in John's gospel, this word sign points to the indicators that, of what Jesus did that proved God sent him. Seven signs leading up to the resurrection that proved Jesus is the one. They said, hey, what's your sign? He said, okay. You tear this temple down, and I will rebuild it in three days. If you're a student of the Bible, you know he is speaking of his resurrection. Sunday morning, leaving the tomb empty, third day declaring quite boldly he is the one he said he is. 
but they don't get that. <laughs> like they, they are not picking up what he's laying down. And so they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This temple has been under construction for 46 years and you're gonna build it in three days? Like they are not tracking. For, for them, they are looking at the temple around them. Herod the Great made it one of his great building projects there in his empire to make the temple grand. I mean, it was a temple that was originally rebuilt over 500 years ago under Zerubbabel, but Herod the Great was making it look good. And the people looking at the temple are going, really? This thing is so awesome. It's taken 46 years to get it to this place and you're gonna rebuild it in three days? When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples looked back and said, ah, that's what he meant. That's what he meant. It's the gospel. If this is new to you, here's the gospel. God sent his son, took on flesh, laid in a manger. His name is Jesus. He lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and rose victoriously for you. And the invitation of the gospel is that you would believe that in your heart, that God so loved you, he provided a way of your salvation, and then profess that Jesus is Lord. My favorite way to profess Jesus is Lord is to declare, I give my life to Jesus. And when you do that, by the dramatic, miraculous work of the Spirit, you are a new person with a new path, and that new life extends into eternity. That's Jesus' invitation. They didn't understand it. His disciples wouldn't understand it until after he left the tomb empty, and then it clicked. And they realized, oh, we thought the temple was the place to come and experience the presence of God. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the one who showed us the manifest presence of God because he is God. And when Jesus raised from the dead, he proved he was who he said he was. He claimed to be God, and then he pulled it off. And God is inviting you into the way of Jesus to give your life to Jesus and discover life in his name. And we're starting to put the pictures together. Oh, okay. The way of Jesus is washing feet. And the way of Jesus looks like making a whip. Following in the way of Jesus means... You serve and forgive even those who harm you the most. To claim the forgiveness of Jesus is also to bear the responsibility to share it with others. Jesus washed Judas' feet knowing he would betray him. When we love like Jesus loved, we forgive like Jesus forgave. But it doesn't mean we're doormats. It doesn't mean we cower when things get difficult because also we, we make whips. When things are going on a trajectory that's just wrong, we're willing to stand up. We're willing to make a scene, not lose our mind, not lose control of our words, but we are willing to step into really difficult situations to say, Hey, that's just not right. Which one's harder for you? To quietly serve, to forgive someone who has harmed you, or for, to stand up in boldness? Which, which part have you been missing in your following of Jesus? During this season of our, our church's life, we just witnessed a few brave teenagers from our congregation who took a really bold step to say no. 
And I had the privilege of sitting with them and their families. And what I heard those brave teenage congregants of ours say was, we can't let this happen to somebody else. There are times that we are prompted by the the Spirit of God to boldly stand. And we don't know how others will respond. We don't know how to be accepted or if we'll be rejected. But the Holy Spirit prompts us to be bold with the truth, never losing control, never lacking love, but to stand for the truth. Even when in our culture, we would be told, oh, that's not loving. We stand in what we know to be true. And this is what we're looking for. As, as we're watching Jesus, this is what we're looking for. As we're entrusting our lives to another person, like this is what you're looking for in a spouse, someone who will serve you and someone who will boldly tell you the truth. This is what you're looking for in a business partnership. Like, don't be unequally yoked. It is more than just marriage. It is marriage and it's more. Like, if you're gonna start a godly business, make sure that you are equally yoked. Make sure you have a partner who will serve you. Oh yeah, I got you covered. And who will tell you the truth. Man, that was off. That's who you're looking for. It's who you're entrusting your spiritual life to. With somebody who's discipling you, leading your ministry team or small group, your elder, your pastor, it's what you're looking for. It's what's expected of us. As we say, come and follow me as I follow Christ. What aspect of following Jesus have you been missing out on? What aspect of life eternally have you not yet stepped into? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for the incredible opportunity to look in your word and to, to study and see accurately who Jesus is. And Lord, I thank you for those times that we realize, oh, uh, that was just an opinion or that's a tradition. It's not actually in the book. And Lord, I pray that you would grow us as students of your word to stand in your truth, boldly standing in your truth, and recognizing when it's, it's, it's just our opinions or it's, that, that, that's just a tradition. As beautiful as it is, it's, it's just a tradition. Lord, that we can more clearly see what it looks like to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. That we can more courageously stand in your truth. That we can more sacrificially love those who intended to hurt us. That we can more see the fullness of Jesus and life that we have in his name. God, lead us in that boldness. Lead us in that willingness to serve others. Take us on this journey in the fullness of following Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen.